Hi, I'm so excited to share with you today the following webinar, Cancer During COVID, Navigating Health Insurance for People with Cancer. Although I'm a lawyer, today's presentation is not legal advice. This presentation also does not establish an attorney-client relationship. Today's webinar is part two of a four-part series supported by a generous grant of the Tower Cancer Research Foundation. The series is called Cancer During COVID because the pandemic has made things more difficult for everyone and can be especially challenging for someone affected by cancer. This is the Cancer Legal Resource Center, and we are a program of the Disability Rights Legal Center based in Los Angeles, California. We help people nationwide. We are an education model and will do intakes in English and Spanish and also have a language line for speakers of other languages. All of our services are confidential. People often ask, what does cancer have to do with the law? This is a list of some cancer-related legal issues. Cancer affects the patient, survivor, families, healthcare professionals, and impacts many different areas of the law. If someone has a legal question and is affected by cancer, whether or not the topic is listed here, they can contact the CLRC for more information. The CLRC also has a professional panel, which includes attorneys from across the country who help those with cancer if a caller needs help with a matter in their state and practice area. You saw on the previous slide the practice areas that attorneys handle, but just to recap some of them, landlord tenant, health insurance matters, medical malpractice, estate planning, employment law, and divorce law. It's a minimal commitment. All that the attorney agrees to is a half hour consultation it's very easy to apply, so if you are a lawyer or know a lawyer, feel free to encourage them to apply to the CLRC's professional panel. I'm going to do my best to leave time for questions at the end of the webinar. Hopefully, I will be able to answer your questions, but if I'm not sure or if you have questions that come up down the road, this is the best way to get in touch with us, either filling out an intake on our website or calling our toll-free number to either leave a message for someone to call you back to complete an intake. All the information we provide is free, though we do not provide legal advice or direct representation. The CLRC also maintains a library of fact sheets of, on a variety of cancer-related legal issues on our website, including a resource called Our Patient Legal Handbook. The handbook provides a brief overview of many of the most common issues and questions that people living with cancer and their families have. And we'd like to give a special thanks to the handbook's generous sponsors, the American Cancer Society and Breakaway from Cancer. If you're interested in receiving a large number of copies of our handbook, please submit a bulk order on our website. We also have the PDFs of the handbook in English and Spanish available to download for free. Our webinars are always free and cover a wide variety of topics. On your screen is the YouTube link to watch our past webinars. This webinar is being recorded, so you will have access to the information and resources provided in this webinar after the recording. This webinar will give an overview of insurance basics, current insurance options, consumer protections, and ways to maintain or change coverage whether you're shopping on or off the health insurance marketplace. The timing of this webinar is very important because due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there are additional opportunities to sign up for health insurance. I'll talk about the COVID-19 up-to-date laws, but first I wanna make sure we discuss the basics so we can understand how the more recent opportunities fit in. I want to quickly go through some of these insurance basics with you. That way, if you're looking to purchase new insurance, you're familiar with the terms you'll be seeing. I know some of this is going to be straightforward and that a lot of you are quite knowledgeable when it comes to your health insurance. 
However, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. The first thing to remember is that it is the patient's responsibility to understand their coverage and limitations. Saying, I didn't know that this wasn't covered doesn't work as a way to get out of a medical bill. Even when we call our insurance company, there's a recording that says verification of benefits is not a guarantee of coverage or something to that effect. We can't even always rely on the physicians treating us to know what's covered by our insurance plans and what isn't, or to what extent. Even if your provider's office says they will call the insurance company to find out or tells you something is covered, it's always a good idea to become familiar with your plan so you understand copays, deductibles, and networks. This helps prevent unforeseen costs. So in part one, we're going to go over some of the basic information everyone should know and understand about insurance. Knowing your insurance company, for example, knowing that it's Blue Shield is not enough. If you call a doctor's office to make an initial appointment, they'll ask whether it's private insurance. This is because Blue Shield is also a Medicare and Medicaid provider in some states. Not all doctors accept all insurance plans. Private insurance is one you buy as an individual or family or get through your employer. If you receive supplemental security income known as SSI, you should be eligible for Medicaid. Medicare is insurance for people who have been receiving social security disability income or SSDI for two years or are 65 years old or older. Private insurance, as well as Medicare Advantage or Medicaid plans, can all be managed care plans, such as HMOs, PPOs, and POS plans. HMO stands for Health Maintenance Organization. HMOs usually have limited choices for their members because members have to select doctors and hospitals from within a participating medical group. This is why they are typically less expensive than a PPO. The other types of private insurance are PPO, which stands for Preferred Provider Organization. Here, the network of providers is less limited than HMOs, and physicians are reimbursed at higher rates for services provided. However, PPOs are usually more expensive than HMOs. POS stands for point of service. These plans combine aspects of HMO and PPO plans where you have to get a primary care physician to make specialist referrals like an HMO. Users usually have some freedom of choice in providers, even those providers who are out of network, such as with a PPO, but with greater out-of-pocket costs. EPO stands for Exclusive Provider Organization Plan. As a member of an EPO, you can use the doctors and hospitals within the EPO network, but, but cannot go outside the network for care. There are no out-of-network benefits. Here are some basic terms to understand. Copay, that is the fixed amount you pay for a covered healthcare service. This is usually paid when you get the service. Most office visits or specialist visits have a fixed copay amount that you will either pay in the office or be billed for later. It's a good idea to become familiar with your copays for different services. For example, your insurance policy might charge you $20 for office visits and $40 for specialists. Deductible, that is the amount you have to pay each year before your health insurance plan begins to pay. For example, if your deductible is $1,000, your plan won't pay anything until you've paid $1,000 for covered services. So your first visit or visits up to $1,000 may all be out of pocket. Coinsurance is usually the amount people are often surprised about. Most insurance, even the best insurance, doesn't cover 100% the cost of a visit. People will usually have a coinsurance, which is your share of the cost of a covered healthcare service. It is usually calculated by a percentage. 
as a percentage. If you paid your copay, but you're billed at a random amount, like $8.93 for a physical therapy visit that cost $89.30, that's probably a 10% coinsurance. So once you meet your deductible, you might have coinsurance on top of your copay. Also, it's really important to know whether or not certain procedures or services require pre-authorization. You may have to get your doctor to submit a prior authorization to your insurance company in order for a service to be paid. Getting something pre-authorized does not always mean that it will ultimately be covered, but not getting pre-authorization when you need it can create administrative challenges. Usually pre-authorization is required for exp expensive procedures like MRIs or expensive medications. It is also important to understand your limits. I'll use physical therapy as an example. Some plans limit you to 20 physical therapy visits a year, while other plans allow you an unlimited number of visits, but you have to see your doctor every month for a prescription so understand your plan's rules about services that you will need. Okay, we have to understand our coverage and read our policies, but where do we find this information? Your evidence of coverage or summary plan description can usually be found on your plan's website. If you have coverage through an employer, you can contact your human resources department to get a copy of the contract if you don't have it. The terms of the policy in the first, is the first place to look in determining what is covered. There are many federal and state health insurance regulations regarding services that health plans must provide that would supersede those provided for in an insurance contract. This means that there are protections that exist as your rights, whether laid out in the plan or not. An example is coverage of pre-existing conditions and annual screenings without needing to pay a copay or deductible. Often, all of this information is available online through your health insurance company's website. You can also call your insurance company to request a hard copy of your plan's documents. If possible, it is best to access this information prior to a time when you are in need of urgent care so that you at least know where and how to access it should an urgent medical question arise. Just like with your overall insurance plan, it's a good idea to become familiar with your prescription drug benefits. Medications must first be approved by the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. Until a drug is approved, it cannot legally be given to anyone, except through an approved clinical trial or a manufacturer's compassionate use program approved by the FDA. Each plan has a formulary or list of approved medications. Formulary medications can usually be prescribed without pre-authorization. Drugs on a formulary are typically grouped into tiers. The tier that your medication is in determines your portion of the drug cost. A typical drug benefit includes three or four tiers. Tier one usually includes generic medications. Tier two usually includes preferred brand medications. Tier three usually includes non-preferred brand name medications. Tier four usually includes specialty medications. This, the insurance company, not your physician, decides what is on their formulary. If your provider prescribes a non-formulary medication, check to see if there's a formulary equivalent. If not, talk with your healthcare provider about requesting special formulary coverage from your insurance company. Some insurance companies require step therapy. This is the practice of beginning drug therapy for a medical condition with the most cost-effective and safest drug, and then progressing to other more costly or risky therapy only if necessary. It is important to work with your doctor on appeals to discuss why the prescribed medication provides you with the best possible outcome. Compassionate use programs allow a manufacturer to give certain individuals a medication that is being tested in clinical trials before the FDA has made a decision about approving or not approving the drug. When the FDA approves a drug, it is approved for certain conditions or indications, as you often see on the label. Regardless of what the label says, a physician can legally prescribe an FDA-approved drug for any reason. This is called prescribing the drug off-label. Note that your insurance company may not approve the coverage. Finally, 
If an insurance company is repeatedly issuing outrageous refusals to provide medication, some desperate patients have taken to social media and at sometimes have even received effective results. Patients can check, and if you're a patient, certainly can check with your insurance company to see if they offer a case manager. Case managers can be your go-to person for information about your plan and often will even go through appeals or advocate on your behalf to gain coverage or reduce costs. If your plan does not offer case managers or patient navigators, ask to speak with the same person each time you call a certain department if possible. Then write down their last name or employee number and extension. It is helpful to keep one contact for each department and make friends with them because some positive rapport can go a long way towards saving a lot of money if they spend time finding ways to reduce your costs. You can also avoid having to re-explain the entire story each time you call. Keeping track of who your contact is will assist with keeping accurate records, including careful notes of each phone call, any written communications, copies of bills, explanation of benefits, and check stubs. These are all very helpful for appeals. Maintaining an accurate journal or a binder of notes will lend credibility to you if there is a discrepancy. While this is a lot of work, filing systems are helpful to assist with keeping track, and it may be helpful to use a notebook to contain all the information. This should go without saying, but open all your medical mail, even if it seems daunting. Now, as you know, I just discussed prior authorization um, so I won't go over it in detail at this time, but just to remember that pr prior authorization can really help with getting prescription drug coverage. If you're opening your mail and have taken, you have taken the first step to understanding what you're up against, sometimes there's no way to appeal decisions if you've waited too long. Thus, it's important to check for mistakes early. Review all bills. Mistakes happen. A simple phone call sometimes helps. Review each charge. We have a handout on our website with some helpful information about medical billing. You have to play an active role in your healthcare delivery, including the billing and payment. It's important not to be caught unaware of what your coverage is. If you read something that you don't understand, call customer service. Take notes. Beyond just knowing what kind of plan you have and how much your deductible is, you might need to know what percentage of certain services are covered and who is in your network and whether they reimburse for out-of-network coverage. If you don't have the energy to do this, see if a friend or family member that you trust would be willing to do this for you. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize that coverage, let's talk a little bit about some of the rules about coverage, as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. I wanna clarify a few terms that refer to different types of private insurance. Group, it's purchased by an employer and offered to eligible employees of the company and their eligible dependents. The employer selects the plan or plans to offer to employees. The premium cost is normally split between the employer and the employee and there is a minimum percentage rate the employer must contribute. Individual, you can purchase individually for yourself and or your family on your own or through the insurance marketplace created by the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is also known as Obamacare. These are often purchased with the guidance of an insurance agent to help navigate plan choices and premium costs. Insured is the more traditional way of providing employees with health coverage, where employers buy a health plan from a company and the employer either pays a portion or the whole premium. This is a fully insured plan. Self-insured means an employer just opts to pay the employee's medical bills directly. This is a more common in larger companies and often people don't know their plan is self-insured because an employer may use an insurance company like Blue Shield as a third-party administrator. Figuring out whether you have a self-insured plan is important when it comes to health insurance appeals. And finally, grandfather plans are those that are created and purchased before the Affordable Care Act on March 23, 2010 they don't have to follow the new rules. So make sure to check the date of when your plan was created. Under the Affordable Care Act, which passed in March 2010, 
and was fully implemented in 2014, a lot of changes took place. One of the most important is insurance plans that count as minimum essential coverage can no longer discriminate against anyone with a pre-existing condition or genetic predisposition, including cancer. The pre-existing condition rule is true for health insurance, not to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. So some states do offer protections for people with existing preconditions who want to obtain those types of insurance, but that topic is out of scope out of the scope for this presentation. So for health insurance, you cannot be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. So for anyone with cancer or a positive genetic test for a predisposition to cancer, you can still buy COBRA, marketplace insurance, and get Medicaid regardless of your health history. Your age and where you live are the only personal characteristics that can be used to set rates. In general, if you're looking to purchase insurance through your state's marketplace or healthcare.gov, the fall is a critically important time of year. So definitely stay tuned for our fall webinar covering this topic. It's important to keep in mind that in general, you can only purchase or change plans during open enrollment if, or if you're eligible for a special enrollment period. So usually it's in the fall from around November 1st to December 15th. And some states have their own online marketplace, while others use healthcare.gov. However, and this is one of the reasons why this webinar is so important with the timing that it is today. Subsequent to an executive order by President Biden on January 28, 2021, the Department of Health and Human Services established a special enrollment period, opening the federal health exchange starting on February 15, 2021. The period was originally set to expire on May 15th, but afterwards, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid expanded this period until August 15th. The states that have their own healthcare exchange are not included in the special enrollment period, but all of these states created their own special enrollment periods. Nine states and DC have special enrollment periods which end before August 15th, 2021. So that is why the webinar talking about health insurance, breaking it down, is very relevant during this time. And normally we would not cover this topic during this time, but because of the special enrollment period, there is an opportunity to consider whether you want to look at another option or whether you want to change anything about your current option. So let's break down a little bit more about the state marketplace insurance. Plans in the health insurance marketplace are organized by metal categories, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. The categories are based on how you and your plan split the costs of your health care. The quality of the care is the same. For bronze plans, the insurance company pays 60% of costs and you pay 40%. For platinum plans, as you can see on your screen, the insurance company pays 90% of costs, you pay 10%. It may be tempting to buy the cheapest plan, the one with the lowest monthly cost, but some of those plans with lower premiums may end up costing you more in the long run. That's if they have higher deductibles or higher out-of-pocket costs. When you enter in your income in the website, you'll learn whether there are tax credits to help you lower the cost of your insurance premiums each month. If you are below 400% of the federal poverty level, you may qualify for tax credits. And in addition to price, when you're shopping for plans, compare all the different insurance company plans. Depending on where you live, there may be option, many options or just a few in that category. So if you like your doctors and providers, first check with those providers to see which market plans, marketplace plans they accept. You might want to choose your plan based on the doctors in the network. Tax credits are now available for people under 65 who purchase coverage on their own in a health insurance exchange and are not covered through their employer, Medicare, or Medicaid. Premium tax credits will be available to help people pay for health insurance that will cap premiums on a sliding scale from 2% to 10% of income. Tax credits are used when you enroll and are paid directly to the cost of your health plan to try to keep your costs down. You do not need to wait to file 
until you file your tax return at the end of the year. Tax credits are only available through the exchanges. It's always a good idea to look at your options off the exchange if you aren't eligible for financial assistance. For example, if you're on Medicare or if you earn a higher amount. Now, let's talk about the American Rescue Plan Act. If you bought marketplace health insurance, like many people, you might have opted to receive premium tax credits in advance to reduce premium costs each month. Since premium tax credits are based on income level, someone might have predicted that they would earn less and thus they would get additional tax credits, but they ended up ending earning more. So they would normally have to pay back those extra premium tax credits because after all they earned a higher salary. But this payback is waived for the past year 2020. That's important information as you're looking at your healthcare costs. Also, there's a subsidy eligibility for those receiving unemployment. So those who receive unemployment benefits in 2021 will have their income treated as no higher than 133% of the federal poverty line or FPL for the purpose of health insurance marketplace subsidies. That could yield additional support in order for paying for a plan. There is an exception, however. If a household member is eligible for affordable employer-based coverage, then that household is barred, prevented from premium tax credits for the health insurance marketplace. There's also something I wanna draw your attention to about the recent laws. The American Rescue Act, before the law, if you earned more than 400% of the federal poverty limit, you could not get a tax credit for the health insurance marketplace. Now, for 2021 and 2022, it's ending the subsidy cliff because there's no earning limit. You, you won't pay more than 8.5% of your income for a premium for a health insurance plan on the marketplace. So if you're curious what the process looks like to shop for an insurance policy, let's use Covered California as an example. These are the questions that you see on your screen that they ask to determine your rates. The most challenging part of this can be entering your household income because you're supposed to anticipate what your income will be next year. Again, we just talked about that. So again, you're going to be estimating what you think. And this can be tough, of course, if you're contemplating leaving your job or if you're in and out of the workforce. There are also ways to search for doctors and facilities. So, however, although these systems have improved since year one, I strongly encourage you to call your doctor or hospital directly to confirm whether they accept marketplace insurance plans. And I'm gonna go back to the previous slide so you can see. So don't just assume that because your doctor accepts an employer-sponsored Blue Shield or Kaiser plan, that they will also accept Blue Shield through Covered California. Make sure you ask. It's a lot easier to ask in advance. So I wanted to make sure to spend a moment on this slide so you could take a look. Here are a few examples of some plans that were available in the Los Angeles area. I know it's very small, but you can compare the prices of these bronze plans. There are generally more HMOs and EPOs on the marketplaces this year. For anyone with a complex chronic health condition, a PPO is probably going to provide more flexibility and will likely have a broader network of doctors, even if the premiums are higher. Here's an example of a Silver Blue Shield plan that was available in Los Angeles area. You'll initially see the monthly premium deductible, primary care visits, etc. If you're on the actual web page, you can click Compare or Summary of Benefits and Coverage. That way, you'll get to see a lot more information about the plan. You may be particularly interested to learn about the prescription drug benefits. Thus, it's important to check the formulary of the plans you're looking at if there are specific prescriptions you need. I want to flag that if you're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, you will not be eligible to get tax credits or other cost savings if you purchase insurance through the health insurance marketplace. Just to clarify some vocabulary, Medicare is for those 65 years of age or older. And enrollment begins within three months of your 65th birthday. 
or those under 65, but who have been receiving SSDI for 24 months, or people who have end-stage renal disease. You still become eligible for Medicare at age 65, even if you have to wait until 66 or 67 to collect your Social Security retirement benefits. You do have to have worked long enough or have enough work credits to be eligible for free Part A Medicare. However, Medicare eligibility is not specifically tied to whether or not you were currently receiving retirement benefits. Traditional Medicaid is for those who meet categorical requirements, are age, blind, or disabled, according to Social Security, and have limited resources, taking into account the things you own, cash on hand, but excluding the home you live in and the car you use. If your income is less than Medicaid limits for your family size, you will receive Medicaid at no cost. In states that have expanded Medicaid, anyone with income under 138% of the federal poverty level is eligible for Medicaid. Medicare's open enrollment period begins on October 15th, so you can already write that date down. You will be eligible to go to medicare.gov to make changes to various aspects of your coverage. You will be able to switch between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, depending on what works best for you. Even if you're satisfied with your plan, it is a good idea to look at what options are out there. Also, plans change from year to year and so can your healthcare needs. Medicare enrollment periods, the initial one is from three months before your 65th birthday until three months afterwards. Open enrollment is once a year, currently between October 15th and December 7th. Special enrollment, if you have healthcare coverage through you or your spouse's job after turning 65 in a company with, 20, uh, with more than 20 employees, one is eligible for enrollment until a specified period after coverage ends. Medicare Parts A and B, eight months following the month, the employer or union group healthcare plan coverage ends or when the employment ends, whichever is first. Medicare Part C and D, during the 63 days after the employer or union group health plan coverage ends or when the employment ends, whichever is first. These are 2021 numbers that you see on your screen. Your tax returns are, all, are used to calculate Medicare costs. It's based on your modified adjusted gross income or MAGI. So part A is free for many people. In other words, they have no premium. A person would only have to purchase part A coverage if they are over 65, but never have paid into social security. This generally only applies to people who have no social security work history or insufficient work history, such as a stay-at-home parent. For people who pay a Part A premium, the 2021 Part A monthly premium is $471 a month if you paid Medicare taxes for less than 30 quarters or $259 if you paid Medicare taxes for 30 to 39 quarters. The Part A Medicare inpatient deductible is 1,484 in 2021. The average 2021 Part B premium is $148.50 per month. You can see that on your screen or higher depending on income. There's also an annual deductible of $203 per year in 2021, which may apply to certain services. People with high incomes, meaning 88,000 individually, 176,000 for married couples, have a higher Part B premium, while people with limited incomes may be eligible for a Medicare savings program for help with paying their Part B premium. In a Part C plan, you generally must pay the Medicare Part B premium. Some Medicare Advantage plans may also charge you an additional premium. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums will decline while plan choices and new benefits increase. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums in 2021 are $21. Costs vary by plan, but the average monthly premium for Medicare Part D is $33.06 in 2021. People with high incomes have a higher Part D premium. 
The deductible varies by plan as well. For Part D, Medicare offers different levels of low-income subsidies called extra help, which can be applied for by submitting an application to Social Security. These pay the cost of prescription drugs above and beyond a standard Part D prescription drug plan. To qualify, you need to receive Medicare and have low income and assets. To qualify in 2021 for extra help, a single person had to have $19,000, 320, sorry, 19,320 or less of annual income. Now, here are some resources. We highly recommend the Medicare Right Center and your state insurance assistance program. For additional Medicare resources, you can contact our office through our online intake as well. We also have a toll-free number. Also check the requirements and eligibility if your state has a health insurance premium payment program. Now I'll pause for a moment so you can jot down this information. However, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar will be recorded so when it is available on our YouTube site, then you can pause the webinar at this time and jot down the information that might be helpful. While our healthcare system was greatly reformed through the Affordable Care Act, that was a great start, but we still have a way to go. There are still many people who fall through the cracks and who cannot afford coverage. Many people with an undocumented immigration status or those who live in states that have not expanded Medicaid need to find other ways to get medical treatment. If you can't get healthcare during any of the ways we've talked about, here are some options. Hill Burton, it's a congressional law which gave hospitals and other healthcare facilities money for construction and modernization. In return, the facilities that received these funds agreed to provide a reasonable volume of service to persons unable to pay. While the program stopped providing funds in the late 1990s, certain healthcare facilities are still obligated to provide free or reduced cost care. You can call the national hotline to get a list of obligated facilities. There's a separate contact number for Maryland residents. Charity care. Many hospitals have free or low cost care available to low income patients. Speak with the social worker or the patient services department at your local hospital to determine which options may be available. Hospitals cannot charge uninsured individuals who qualify for financial assistance more than what they charge insured patients. The limitation on gross charges applies to all hospital care, not just emergency care and private health insurance. Although this can be an expensive option, anyone can purchase private health co coverage as long as they do so directly from an insurance company or through an insurance broker. So now to the third part of our presentation. Sometimes a phone call can result in a lot of savings and other times a formal appeal needs to be made, but it all starts with knowing your plan. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize that coverage, and we also talked about additional COVID-19 pandemic era protections, I want to talk a li little bit about some of the rules about coverage as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. Now that we briefly covered marketplace insurance, Medicaid and Medicare, I'm going to briefly discuss COBRA and state COBRA. Now, as you can see on your screen, if you are employed or were recently employed, COBRA, which stands for Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act, which now you can understand why people just generally say COBRA, allows you to continue on your employer insurance for a period of time even after you are no longer an employee. COBRA is a federal law that provides for continuation of coverage. Under COBRA, a former employee keeps the same insurance if they lose their job or drop below the number of hours required to get insurance through their job, or if they lose coverage their spouse was providing by divorce, legal separation, or death. 
or they become entitled to Medicare. It's expensive, but it may be the best option for people under people currently going through treatment. A patient can continue the same insurance coverage from their employer without having to switch doctors. So if someone feels strongly that they need to see their specific doctor for as long as possible, even if the cost is higher, this could be a good option. One downside is that the purchaser will pay the full premium. The portion they were paying as an employee plus the portion their employer was paying and an administrative fee totaling 102% of the monthly premium cost. That's because that person is no longer working for that employer. An employee may qualify for COBRA if you work for an employer with 20 or more employees. The standard period of COBRA coverage is 18 months for leaving their job, but they could potentially be eligible for an extension under certain circumstances, such as someone becomes disabled according to Social Security or has a second qualifying event. Most people know about COBRA, but many people don't know that some states have laws similar to COBRA that apply to employers with fewer than 20 employees or that extend the time period that a person may be eligible for continued coverage. For example, in California, Cal COBRA applies to employers with two to 19 employees and lasts up to 18 months. Or for those working for an employer of 20 or more employees, this law may extend regular co COBRA coverage for another 18 months, equaling up to 36 months of coverage. Cal COBRA is more expensive, and during the time you're on Cal COBRA, you could be responsible for up to 110% of premiums. Now, as of the date of this recording, I talked about the America, American Rescue Plan Act. It was signed into law by President Biden on March 11, 2021. That's very recent to this webinar. And uh, one of the reasons why it was really important and great timing to cover this topic. If your employer laid you off or reduced your hours, the federal government subsidizes 100% of COBRA premiums until September 30th, 2021. This does not count as income for tax purposes. Now you might ask, well, Shelly, why didn't you just tell us this upfront? You just talked about premiums, and now you're saying that during this time, there's the American Rescue Plan Act that is covering 100% of the COBRA premiums. Well, the important thing is that for in order for you to appreciate the significance of this law and the impact that it has, it number one, is important to understand what is the framework that this law came into place. In other words, the context. Moreover, as you can see, as of the date of this recording, the federal government subsidy of 100% of the COBRA premiums is only under until September 30th. That means after September 30th, again, as of the date of this recording, the federal government will not subsidize 100% of the COBRA premiums. So it's really important, especially for someone affected by cancer, where the cancer might not just end or treatment might not just end September 30th. September 30th, right? You might have additional considerations. You may want to continue with your COBRA coverage. So it's important to understand what the costs are before this law came into place and what might be the landscape after. So another aspect of the American Rescue Plan Act that affects COBRA is that it extended the enrollment period. So if you're not enrolled in COBRA or if you were enrolled but discontinued coverage, you can still enroll in subsidized COBRA. The enrollment period just started April 1st, 2021, and it extends until 60 days after the health plan notifies you about the extended enrollment. So just to be clear, the COBRA subsidies are not available to those eligible to enroll in another group health plan qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement or flexible spending arrangement and also for those eligible for Medicare. So there are exceptions and if you are in that exception and the COBRA subsidies do not apply for you, it is also just yet another reason that you can know the importance of the framework of what the cost might be and both the plus sides and negative sides. So if you're under 65, you may notice that there are certain gaps in the insurance system. 
The first is that a person only eligible for Medicare is only eligible for Medicare if they are under 65 and have been receiving SSDI for two years. Therefore, a person under 65 who becomes disabled has a minimum period of two years before they can access Medicare. After receiving SSDI, a person who was previously eligible for Medicaid due to low income may lose it due to the income they are receiving from SSDI. This creates a problem of figuring out how to get insurance while you wait for Medicare to kick in. Options include COBRA or purchasing insurance through the healthcare exchange. Some states provide assistance to making COBRA payments through programs such as health insurance premium payment programs, known as HIP, and I briefly discussed that before, but I wanted to bring it up in this context. In addition to the gaps while awaiting Medicare to kick in, plans that might be required through insurance companies to supplement Medicare, such as Medigap plans or Medicare Advantage plans, are currently allowed to hike up prices to people that are under 65 because they believe that the cost for a person who is disabled may exceed the cost for an average person reaching age 65. I want to briefly cover this topic uh, just so you can become familiar with the landscape, but we're not going to go um, too much into detail. So, out of network providers working at in network facilities. So, that's an important topic because it could happen all the time and you might not even be aware that it's happening. So, we should be familiar with our policy and make sure our providers are in network. And that's an important thing that we talked about today. We know we'd end up on the hook for more out-of-pocket expenses if we see an out-of-network provider. But what if you've done that? You schedule a surgery with an in-network surgeon at an in-network hospital. You get a bill for the out-of-network anesthesiologist that you didn't pick. So a Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that among insured non elderly adults struggling with medical bill problems, charges from out-of-network providers were a contributing factor about one-third of the time. So this is definitely a big problem. And this happens to people sometimes and is known as surprise balance billing, where the provider bills you for the balance the insurance didn't pay for an out-of-network provider. So I gave that example, the Consolidation Appropriations Act, or CAA, includes provisions to alleviate this issue called the No Surprises Act. That was passed um, before the new year uh, by President Trump. And starting in 2022, patients will not receive balance bills if they receive emergency care, are transported by an air ambulance, or receive non-emergency care at an in-network hospital, but are unknowingly treated by an out-of-network physician or receive lab services from an out-of-network lab. Patients only pay the copay and deductible that they normally would be charged by an in-network provider. This provision does not apply to ground ambulance services. Also, a patient may choose in advance to be treated by an out-of-network physician at an in-network hospital. In that case, the patient will be balance billed as long as they received a cost estimate and provide consent to be treated by that physician and pay the balance bill. So there definitely is progress in that area and that's important to note as you consider what care you might need. Now, I talked about some COVID-19 related resources, and if you'd like to know the source of that, it is on your screen. I mentioned these resources within the context of providing information. So if you wanna jot down, I'll pause for a moment. However, as I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and you can stop the webinar on this page on our YouTube site and write down the website if it is something that you might want to look into further for more information. Here are the resources regarding the information on COVID-19 mentioned in the talk. You can see it on your screen. I'm going to pause a little bit longer here because there's some other additional resources and I mentioned them as COVID-19 resources because this might be something, th these resources are available year round, but especially during the pandemic, these resources might be especially important 
if you have pandemic related issues and you're affected by cancer in some way, either you're a caregiver or a person facing a cancer diagnosis, if you're even past treatment, but you have additional non-medical side effects, you want to fill an online intake or give us a call, we will help you, even if it's, of course, not related to the pandemic, but it's related to cancer in some way. But especially during the pandemic, there are additional issues or additional difficulties that come up for someone with cancer. So we have now reached the end of this presentation on health insurance options and navigating health insurance for people with cancer, especially during the pandemic. There are so many additional concerns, but also some additional opportunities that we went over today. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have general questions about today's presentation or need some clarification, I'll take some time for questions. I won't log off just yet, but if you just bear with me for a moment, I will end the recording now to answer questions if there are any. So again, please check out our free national resources. While I did give some examples from California, we help people nationwide, all over the country, people contact us with their questions. So thank you so much for participating in this presentation. Please remember that if you have any questions that are specific to your situation, you can either call the CLRC, that number is on your screen, I'll leave this up for a moment so you can write it down, or you can fill out an online intake form and we will get back to you. So the way that I like to think of it is that you can call, leave us a message, however, you don't have to both call and fill out an online intake, we will get back to you, of course, but if let's say you're, you wake up in the middle of the night, you have, someone, you, have an, you have an issue that's keeping you up at night, you can fill an online intake anytime, any day, you're not waking us up, and you could get that information answered. So thank you so much for your time. And again, I will be, I will be ending the recording and I'm going to check if there are any questions in the chat and I'd be happy to do the best of my ability to answer those questions.